Gaelic Castle, Gaelic Castle, a wheat nut guisa. Like to acknowledge the unceded territory that we are gathered today on of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. Nuko am Guagua Dakala. I in class, we will come. I in class, Likwido, Lu Kamatu. My name is Chris Roberts. I'm the elected chief counselor of the Wewakam First Nation, which is based out of Campbell River on Vancouver Island, coastal British Columbia. We are gathered here today as chiefs, representatives, and leadership of BC communities where there was or is salmon farming in our territories. The First Nations Finfish Stewardship Coalition, that's right, Finfish and Stewardship, those two things can go together. It is through our rights and title that we must have a say on how, if, and what kind of salmon farming can and should take place in our territories, in our backyards, where we have lived for millennia. After the disrespectful and damaging decisions to close salmon farms in, our, in my territory of the Liquido people, in the Discovery Islands without proper consent of the rights holders, we as a coalition can no longer trust that Minister Murray can deliver a thoughtful and unbiased transition plan for the remaining salmon farms in our sovereign territories. That is very worrisome as I stand here with my brothers and sisters of tribes of the coast. We as First Nations, we are the original environmentalists, not the fancy downtown activists that you hear about. Our people have been looking after wild salmon for thousands of years, and we continue to do so through our guardian programs and our monitors, and we will continue to do so. People 5,000 kilometers away should not be making political, activist-driven decisions for ancient nations that have been stewards of our lands and waters and resources since time immemorial. Now we know that there are divergent views on salmon farming among First Nations on the coast of British Columbia. And that's their right, but it's also our right as First Nations to be able to say yes. If a nation can say no to a resource extraction or development activity in their territory, they should be able to say yes. And that is because it's done on their terms, on terms that are set out by the laws and traditions of our people. And it's those laws and traditions that will guide how business is carried out, how things will be monitored properly. This enduring stewardship obligation that I talk about is bestowed to all of us from the creator of the territories that we call our homes all across Turtle Island. And we must respect each other as sovereign nations and trust in each other that we will uphold those. And when we disagree, we should come together, nation to nation, to talk about our differences of opinion, to find areas of compromise, and to seek to understand how we might be able to move forward collaboratively. <clears throat> the DFO Minister Murray's decision to close all salmon farms in Discovery Islands against the wishes of the right holding nations, in our case as the Liquido people, has set a dangerous precedent. Not only does it mean that the rest of the transition planning process for the sector is unstable, it threatens salmon farm operations in the rest of the territories where those nations want those farms to operate. More importantly, her decision has threatened right holder First Nations' ability to pursue their self-determination and their right to economic reconciliation by allowing outside influences to make decisions in our territories. Just a little bit more about the proposal that was put forward from the Liquido Nations. We were seeking to understand what the impacts are. Every sector, every single activity in our territories has an impact. And it's our responsibility to understand what those are, to determine if we can come to grips with them and manage them in a way that's sustainable and in keeping with our true values and traditions. It's really sad that our proposal was not accepted because it's a lost opportunity. The opportunity that existed was to advance our guardian watchman programs, our fishery stewardship technicians, to directly participate in the research and monitoring to evaluate the impacts from salmon farming on the environment on wild salmon. I'm not going to deny that those exist, but as we talk about a transition, as this government likes to call it, we wanted to be on the front lines of what that would be, to embrace new innovations and the possibilities of new technologies that could be implemented to reduce or eliminate the risks to wild salmon. And the fact that our proposal was disregarded 
uh, is troubling. It, it sends a signal that I don't know if there was ever a, a genuine interest in um, supporting a transition. And so to just kind of mandate something to land base in this case, it doesn't make sense to me because there's a lot of evidence and investment across the world where this has been attempted and maybe it will be figured out one day. But if we talk about a transition and going towards something better, we have to embrace and work with what we have now. To try and flick it off like a switch, I think it flies in the face of what is required to have investment in research and development and bring new innovations. So we call on Prime Minister Trudeau to pass the critical file onto a more responsible and unbiased minister to complete. We strongly recommend the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Reconciliation, the Honourable Mark Miller, for this job. We are also fathers and mothers, grandmothers, grandfathers like you, who want to see our families succeed and communities thrive and have a promising future. Like you, we want our people to have good jobs. And like you, we want everyone to be able to afford healthy food and put food on their tables for their families. The Government of Canada is on a dangerous track with its policy decision to close sustainable farming in our waters. They are suggesting that we grow Canadian salmon on land. Even the BC government says it's not feasible and at this point in time it does not make sense. We have with us an uh, example here. <clears throat> the salmon that you see, it was not grown in Canadian waters where it could have been or should have been. It was not grown in any of our territories where it could have been and should have been. It was not processed by workers in the community of Klemtu, of the Kittisu Hey Hey, or the community of Port Hardy on North Vancouver Island, because Minister Murray has severely impacted the production of the salmon farming industry by closing down farms in our territory, and we're concerned of the track that that might continue on with the rest of the coast. The piece of salmon was flown all the way from Norway or Chile, thousands of kilometers away. And when you think about the net effect and of citizens of the planet that we care for of, of climate change and carbon emissions, how is that sustainable? And because of decisions by Minister Joyce Murray, it's costing you and your family more in your grocery bills to put this healthy meal on your tables for your family. Not sure what the price of it says, but I think, uh, yikes. I think it's $55 for this slab of salmon, something that would have previously costed around $30. And this piece of salmon is going to become even more unaffordable for you and your families if these decisions continue. Not only because it's imported from far away, but because we no longer have the jobs of farming salmon in the, in the communities. And we have also been fishing nations. It's ingrained in my blood for several generations. But we are also salmon farming nations that we stand here together, and we are coastal nations. And we should have the right to decide what happens in our territory. This is an important job that we have, and I'm reminded by some of my elders and people in my community that often have a difficult time coming to grips with various um, industries because of their perceived impacts. But when we talk about it, we were reminded that as newcomers came to our territories, the balance has been disrupted from day one. And we have constantly had to adapt to changing times. A lot of the things that are being sought to protect is the commercial salmon fishing industry, which I'm proud of my family's participation in for many years. But an industrial commercial scale fishery on the whole coast of British Columbia with countless canneries dotting the coastline, that was not our way as a people. But we were participants in that and we embraced it. Unfortunately, our rights to make decisions on how that fishery would be managed weren't recognized early enough and we were suffering the consequences of a vast reduction in salmon on the coast. So when we look at a new industry like salmon farming, we are also meeting it head on embracing it for the opportunity that it could be and ensuring that things are happening on our terms. And that's very important because each nation is, is distinct and unique and they have their own set of laws and values that must be upheld for this industry to continue. Gaila Kessler.
Good luck, Hessler. Nugam Yakawidi. My name is Albert Charlie, and I'm I'm from Port Hardy, but I come from a nation, Nakwa Guasala. Um, a very small community who relies on this industry um, very much. Um, <laughs> land base is not possible in our territories. The BC government conducted its own feasibility study on whether it's viable and it is not, period. <clears throat> forcing, us into, forcing us to transition to land-based farming means that we lose industry completely. Our communities will be de devastated. We will return to poverty and the dark days enforced the gov by government on our people decades ago. Think about it. No land farm built in northern BC when it could be built in Seattle close to an airport. It makes no sense that the government of Canada is trying to shut down sustainable salmon farming when its science says just that, it's sustainable. We don't grow cows in waters. Why on earth would we grow salmon on land instead of our oceans? As Chief Robert said, it's already incredibly expensive to our families to make ends meet in Canada. Food costs more, salmon costs more for families, and it's because of government decisions. 40% of salmon farms have already been removed from BC waters as a result, and the result has been increased cost salmon Canadian families and bigger carbon imp imprint from flying more salmon into Canada from Chile and Norway. <clears throat> How is this meeting the Liberal government's climate goals and reconciliation goals or Canada food security affordable goals? This is fail across the board. We, we want to be clear. We as right holder First Nations that host salmon farming in waters must be, must be the decision makers regarding the future and transition of the sector in our territories. We are calling on Prime Minister Trudeau, Minister Miller, Minister... Aju? Minister... Madhu, Madhu, Lamedi, and cabinet colleagues to ensure that our rights and titles are respected. Um, we are calling on Minister Champagne, Minister and Ng, Minister Hutchins, Minister Wilkinson, Minister. Oh, I don't even know this. Qualtro? Qualtro, Minister. Sejan, to ensure that the, that we continue to have BC farming sector that includes workers in indigenous and rural communities up and down the coast. We are calling on Minister O'Regan to consider the good paying labor jobs that are being lost and not replaced. We are calling on Minister Gold and Minister of Families, Children, and Social Development to speak about the decisions that pushing our children and families into poverty, not moving them ahead. We are warning Atlantic communities and ministries that eco-activists are coming for salmon farming next. there next. They will not stop, and Minister Murray's recent Discovery Island decision has empowered them to pursue closures on the East Coast. The government of Canada needs to stop just talking about reconciliation to win votes and actually start practicing it. Reconciliation is not talking point to First Nation. It is our future. Stop making decisions to our remote Indigenous communities based on pressures of urban campaign founders, funders and votes. We have suffered enough and we have had enough. Gaila Kessler. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Harvey Robinson. My traditional name is Nimkamsu. I'm a hereditary chief from Kitasu. And I'm just here to support my my uh, group of families behind me, and uh, we all stand together. We try to keep our jobs in our community and wish all nations to join us and be able to support. 
what we're doing because uh, there's a lot of things that are going on and and I you know I mentioned this morning and I said you know a lot of my colleagues behind me talked about um, the way it was back in the 60s. You know, we lost a lot of younger youth on that because we, we had no jobs anymore. We had a cannery, but we had no jobs because they shut it down. That's the reason why we looked at fish farming, agriculture, so we can have our people working so we don't have to lose lives in our community. That's the reason why I'm here, and not, not very often I take my uh, my headpiece with me and my regalia to come and stand here to be able to help with my colleagues behind me, and we'll try to save what we have. Thank you. Right, just a reminder for people on Zoom, if uh, you have a question, please use the raising function. Just uh, pour rappeler les gens sur Zoom, si vous avez une question, d'utiliser la fonction main levée. <coughs> Fortunately, I have no questions on Zoom. Just if there are no the questions, questions, there's just a few comments that I'd like to add. Um, this is new for me to stand here in this type of a forum, and there's so much to say. When we think about something like the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, often referred to as UNRIP. I say the whole phrase of what it is so it's not lost on us. And this federal government's commitment to implementing UNRIP and what that means to us as a people, I think it scares a lot of Canadians. I think it scares a lot of Canadians because it introduces a big question mark of well, what are First Nations going to say? Is it giving them a veto? And embedded within the articles of the United Nations Declarations on the Rights of Indigenous People is the requirement to obtain our consent, our free, prior, and informed consent, among many other articles that are existed in there. And this is the work that is incumbent upon us as nations and as governments to, to determine and figure out for the future. And this is why it's so frustrating to lose the opportunity that we had in the proposal that was put forward to take our stewardship technicians, our frontline men and women that are out in the territories gathering information to the next level and be the direct participants in that research that are taking that information to our hereditaries, to our community, and to our leaders so that the decisions we arrive at, providing our consent or non-consent, are informed and are based on sound positions in keeping with who we are as a people. And when that happens, that is when we are going to achieve certainty and predictability across this land of Turtle Island, made up of sovereign indigenous nations across this country. And that's a really exciting thing. And uh, we're trying to do that work, and we're making proposals, we're making efforts to um, see those results. It becomes difficult, though, when, of course, we don't always agree on things. So in this case, there is a large contingent that is um, very vocally opposed to the salmon farming industry. And I just think that we haven't sat down across the table from one another enough to explain where we're coming from and what our goals and objectives are, because I don't think they're so far at odds. And I invite, I understand there's a delegation of nations in Ottawa from the coast that are speaking to government, and we invite an opportunity to sit down with them to talk nation to nation about how we can move forward in a good way, uh, respecting each other and, um, and working together. Thank <clears throat> you.